good? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk to you about a topic near and dear to my heart, mainframes. Um, just a quick show of hands. I'm just curious how many people are mainframers? How many mainframers have we got in the house? Uh, zero. That's what I expect. How many people have actually audited or tested a mainframe in the house? A lot more than zero. So, so people who aren't mainframers are testing these things out there. I'm hoping to dispel a little myths and get some knowledge going. So let's hear. A little bit about me. I'm a senior IT security analyst. Since the movie Tron, you probably can't see my shirt. It's a little recognizer from Tron. Since the movie Tron, I've been fascinated with mainframes. I used to run around. This might date me. I used to run around on Datapack and Telnet back in the day. Tel Enet, I guess. Um, that's not me, but that's who I used to pretend I was when I was running around on these X25 networks. Uh, this is what most people think of when they think of a mainframe. If I say the word mainframe, you're probably going to see some, think something like this. It's got some tape, spools. It's got a printer, some chairs from the 70s. And if you're not thinking about that, you're definitely thinking of the IT room from the 60s with some guy at some kind of thing, another dude fixing a printer jam. This is probably what you're thinking of. Or maybe you're thinking, oh yeah, green screen. You know, I can input some kick stuff and I can do some cool things. Uh, in reality, this is what a current modern mainframe looks like. It doesn't take up as much space as it did in the 60s, obviously. And they're releasing them now. This actually just came out. This machine here just came out this past year. Um, it runs an operating system called ZOS. You may hear it called MBS locally. Um, but generally, it's called ZOS by IBM. The current version is version 1, release 13, or 1.13. They have this weird nomenclature. Uh, it was released in 2011. They basically do a new revision every two years. So, and your mainframe operators are installing this new revision every two years. It's a modern operating system. It runs on modern hardware. It's not a legacy piece. It's running modern things. 70% uh, of Fortune 500s are running an IBM ZOS. Uh, now, according to IBM, 95% of Fortune 100s are running IBM mainframes. And then some report I just read today, they said all top 1,000, 95% of them are running mainframes. Who knows? But it's a lot. And generally, these companies aren't using mainframes to host your little intranet little website. They're hosting the crown jewels of the company. The key business items for the company are being run on the mainframe. If, you're, if you took United, you took any other airline here, somewhere along the line, you were using a mainframe, either changing your schedule, booking the flight, anywhere along that chain, there was a mainframe involved. Unfortunately, this is still the user interface. This is still how you have to interact with the mainframe. So how do you do that? You use TSO, a thing called time sharing option. It's used to interact with the mainframe. It's similar to a shell, like, a, like Bash. Um, you have standard networking commands. You can FTP, you can do Telnet, you can do remote shell, you can do netstat. In fact, there's no IF config on this. You just type netstat home, and that'll show you all the interfaces configured on the mainframe, which blew one of the mainframe operators' minds when I told them you could do that to display what IP addresses were configured. Uh, problem with TSO? The max characters for the username is seven, so you can't have a username bigger than seven characters, and the max password size is eight. Uh, someone here, if there's any mainframe, if there were any mainframe people here, someone would say, oh, you could use passphrases, but that's not, I've never seen it happen. You're also limited to a limited character set, uh, A through Z, um, and then zero through nine, and then they call these like international characters, but it's just these three characters. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they call it international, they could just say those three characters, but they call them international. Uh, look, look, it looks like any prompt. It looks like almost like a Commodore 64. It says ready, you type your command, and you're good to go. It has something similar to man. You can type help, space, then the command you want help with. If you want help with RSH, help, space, RSH, and it'll tell you everything you need to know. It has networking commands, like I said. You can do trace route and all that stuff. Um, this is part of the presentation that usually blows people's minds when I've given this presentation. Uh, it comes with Unix, and when I say it comes with Unix, it's running alongside TSO. So when you're in here, there's also a Unix environment running as well. And why is that? Because it's running the TCP IP stack. You cannot run TCP IP without using Unix. You could, and there's this really complicated way to do it, but nowadays everyone's using the TCP IP stack from Unix to do all of their TCP IP. Also, if you have an account and you're part of this group, bpx.superuser, you can sudo root without, using, without needing a password. So that's fantastic. Also, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing called surrogates in mainframes where you can give someone permission to run commands as you. Um, like a job, you submit a job and it runs as me. Uh, but 
if I give you surrogate authority, you can also sue to my account in Unix without needing to know my password, and then start issuing commands. Uh, RACF is a resource access control facility. Everything, and I mean everything, security related, is controlled in this one database. It's a monster database. It controls access to users, controls access to groups, controls access to files, controls access to, like, say, to Unix. You can control access to everything. That bpx.superuser is a setting in, in the RACF database. Also stores the hashed values for users' passwords, and also in some instances also holds the private keys for encryption. So one monster database to hold all these things. Now there's no concept of root on the mainframe. It's what's called special. So if someone has special, think of it more like a database and less like a file system, like a normal, like a Linux type situation. It's more about if they have special access, they might not have access to the files, but they can give themselves access to the files. That's, that's how you have to think about it. The default username and password is IBM sys1, IBM user slash sys1. Uh, you, can't you can't delete it, you can't change it, you can't do anything about it. You can disable this account, which most shops will do, but if you change the password next time you reboot the mainframe, it'll just change it back. So you can't, you can't change this. Now, you'd think that this database would be impossible to find. They would have it hidden in some special memory storage place, and you wouldn't be able to find it on the mainframe, and it would be, oh, impossible to find. Anyone here who, ever, who has an account on a mainframe, I implore you tonight, not on our network, I implore you tonight to go connect to the mainframe and type the command rvery, which will tell you exactly where the RACF database is stored. Anyone on the mainframe can run this command. You don't need super user privileges. You don't need anything special. If you have an account, you can run our very, it'll tell you where the database is stored. Permission to even read this database needs to be locked down. If you're auditing a mainframe, you need to ask them who has read access to this database, because, and I'll explain, you'll see why later why it needs to be locked down. The master console. The master console, here, I'll give you an example. This is what a master console looks like. It's uh, basically, you know when you turn on Linux for the first time, and it's got all that garbage that runs up the screen, not garbage, but all that stuff running up the screen? That's essentially the same concept here, except here, when it's, it's, once it's done booting, you can actually input commands as the system. So if I wanted to stop TCP IP, if I wanted to turn off rack F, for example, you wouldn't do that because then it would just prompt operators to approve everything. But you can just turn things on, turn things off, you can turn on FTP. It runs at system level privileges. Now the key issue with the master console is there's no authentication required. Once it's connected, it's there. If you disconnect it, that closes the port and someone's got to turn that port back on and then you reconnect and you get back to the master console. But companies have gotten around that by setting up other types of technologies to just keep that screen live all the time. So if you see like a Citrix or you see like a VNC, they might be using that to keep those sessions open. So that's, that's it. That's all I'm going to talk about mainframes. I'm going to talk about how you can actually go ahead and test some of these mainframes. It's very frustrating. It's a very frustrating experience for me because there's nothing out there. The tools don't exist. Um, there's no information. The information that there is is woefully out of date. Or you have IT security folks that are talking to non-IT mainframe folks, and they sort of don't mix well, I found. So they're not really talking to one another. So the tools, there are some tools on mainframe for security, and they're very expensive. But that community is not talking to the security community as a whole. Also, the frameworks like Nessus and those don't have many tools. Um, for example, Nmap, there's nothing. There's no scripts to do any kind of nothing on ZOS. There's no Metasploit modules, and there's no Nessus modules. There's nothing, and I've looked. And I didn't do just a search for IBM ZOS. I searched for multiple terms. There's a ton of iSeries stuff, and there's a lot of AS400 stuff, but there's no ZOS anything. However, Nmap, it's not so bad. You run Nmap, it does a scan, it comes back and it tells you to find all these things. Except the version it tells you when it finds things running is OS 390. Okay, that's close enough. Um, but OS 390 was discontinued in 2004, so like nine years ago. And companies are still using mainframes and updating their mainframes. So it's not like they just stopped and said, we're gonna stay at OS 390 forever. The reason that it's OS 390 and I've done, I've looked at the, the, the email groups. Um, the last person to email 
the Nmap mailing list to make a patch for mainframe anything was in 2004. So that's why it says OS 390. So I submitted my own patch to Nmap to change it. Only all it did was make a change in the tables, the services tables, to replace OS 390 to ZOS. Turns out that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is you submit information and then they add ZOS or OS 390 or SNA. Um, but you can get this patch. It's available on my, my GitHub. It's ready to go. So that way you can actually see ZOS instead of seeing OS 390. But everyone here now knows OS 390 means ZOS if you're using Nmap. Now let's talk about enumerating users. Anyone can tell me what's wrong with this picture? Anyone? It tells you right there that the user ID, I know guys in the back, you can't see it, sorry. It tells you right on the screen that the user Shmoocon is not authorized. It doesn't tell you it's got a bad password, it just says that this user doesn't exist, or it might not be authorized to use TSO. So I thought that was great. I thought, oh my God, someone must have found, these things have been around for 50 years. Someone must have done something with this. So I went back and I looked, and there's nothing. There's no tools, THC Hydra, nothing. Medusa, nothing. So I took the initiative and I wrote a Python tool called TSO Brute. What TSO Brute does is uses a 3270 script. It uses basically, the, you can download the client, x3270. And what it does is it initiates a connection. Once it connects, it sends a fake user ID and then it tries to enumerate all the users. Now if you set it into brute force mode, it'll find a user and then try to brute force the account with password lists. So I'll have a quick little demo here you can see. Now I also made it fun so you can show your bosses and stuff how scary this can be. So I made a movie mode. So once you run it, it'll launch X3270 and then start going through and start hacking your, uh, your mainframe. So you can watch it in real time. Yes, it's very slow. It's like molasses. So I like to say it gets there eventually. You'll get a user ID. So you can see it got to the prompt, it's going, it can't find a user. Also, notice how I mentioned at the beginning, there's all these rules with TSO that you can't do for user IDs. So I've built that into the tool so it'll skip. So if you just take a word list and throw it in, it'll skip these items because it says, oh, it does it. It starts with a number. You can't start with a number. So here I found IBM user, and now it's going through the accounts. Oh, and now it found the password sys1. Let's stop this. So that's TSO Brute. That's available on the GitHub as well. Then I thought, well, I mean, TN3270 is a plain text protocol. Um, it's very easy to sniff. You can, use, you can just launch Wireshark and there's an EBCDIC. Everything on the mainframe, by the way, is EBCDIC. Uh, you can just click on the little EBCDIC button and it'll say, hey, great, I'll, do, I'll follow the stream and I can, you can decode it and everything. Not so great in other tools, um, but it's, it's easy to capture. Uh, someone once told me after I wrote about this, Oh, but SSL's been available since the mid-90s, and in my research it's about, I would say it's about half. Half of the places use, use SSL and half don't. Um, I don't know why. SSL's been available for 15, 20 years, but they're legacy, so they don't want to do it. Um, but this is a pain in the butt, right? No one wants to look, like, this is awful. I've, I've redacted my user ID. This is actually for a Master of the Mainframe contest. I've redacted my username and password here, but you can capture this, but this is kind of nasty. So I wrote a tool called MF Sniffer that, that's Python based, uses Scappy. Uh, all it does is it sits and it waits and if it sees someone trying to connect to a mainframe, it'll grab the username and then it grabs the password. Not great, it's proof of concept, it eats up a ton of RAM. Um, but luckily enough, someone got interested after I wrote about it and said, hey, well, that would be a cool dissector to have in Intercap. So they went ahead and, and took my script and converted it into a dissector for Intercap. So today, if you went and you download the source off of GitHub and compiled it, you would be able to sniff mainframe credentials using a man-in-the-middle attack using Intercap. So by the way, Diru is the guy who, who put that code into, into the Intercap production. And then I made some changes so that it was obvious you're, you're sniffing ZOS TSO credentials. Finally, cracking these things offline. So like I said, the RackF database has got everything in it, right, including the hashes. So I thought, well, if I can get a copy of this database, Surely I can just start cracking these hashes and be done. It's, it's just DES, right? Everyone knows that? RackF uses DES? Oh, no one knows that because IBM publishes it in a little line and they say that it uses a one-way DES hash. It uses DES to hash your user ID with your password. So not too hard to reverse engineer that. So Diru wrote 
He's a gentleman at OpenWall, by the way. He wrote a plugin for John the Ripper to actually go ahead and strip out the user IDs and the hashes from a RackF database, once you get a copy of it locally, and then start cracking away at them using John the Ripper. It's fast, it's great, I've used it, it's fantastic. You can get it at this GitHub as well. And I have a link on my blog at the end to all these links so that you're not like furiously typing this little tiny link at the bottom here. So after, after a while I thought, well, surely there must, be in, there must be mainframes available on the internet, right? I mean, surely. So I went ahead and I started using Shodan and I found nothing, I couldn't find anything. So, I, so I, I made a little tweet and I was like, man, I can't find any mainframes on, uh, on Shodan. And the creator of Shodan tweeted me back and said, well, what are you looking for? And we started emailing back and forth. And then he started adding a little bit to, to Shodan to start looking at port 23 and port 992 and some of the default ports that mainframes are using. And now you can use search terms like, like I use IBM V5R because that's what the web server will say, the version of the web server is. And then that's probably running on a mainframe so you can also look for port 23 on there. Uh, or you can just look for this, this super cryptic IK, whatever. I'm not gonna read it out. If you look for that, you're gonna find some mainframes. So I'd like to use what time I have left to, to show you some interesting internet mainframes that I've found in, in the past little bit. So this is the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services. <laughs> I don't even know why that's publicly available. If this was, I mean, it would be nice if it, like a website has some like information. There's no information, you just log in. Uh, the state of New Mexico, this one was a fun one because I had no idea what it was. It just said state of New Mexico. It's like, that's great. So then I looked it up and it's the driver services database <laughs> for the state of New Mexico. Um, this is the Department of Human Services for Oregon. Uh, I don't know if that DHS TSO is for Department of Homeland Security. I hope it's not, please don't. <laughs> I didn't do anything, I just took a screenshot and left, I, I swear. <laughs> and then the court information system for Raleigh, North Carolina. I don't know why that's, I mean all of these, I don't know why they're publicly available. I mean really. So, it, I mean, I know why this one's publicly available, it's an IBM one and they're using it for research. But the other ones, I mean really, why is this? publicly available, why am I able to get onto the Oregon Department of, of Human Services and start even just to poke around? Not even, like if this was a website, people would be like, why is your human services website publicly available where you're telling people what commands to run and how to get there? This is all just, just out there. And some of these aren't even encrypted, by the way. Some of these are just plain old telnet. You could sniff the credentials right off the line. So I know I'm a little bit early. Um, I didn't know how long it was gonna take. One thing I wanna talk about real quick before I gotta finish up is, is, and I didn't put any slides in here, is, is one of the main reasons there's nothing, none of this research going on is because you can't get access to a mainframe, right? They're like, what, $500,000 plus? Um, that's just for the, the CPUs, and then it's, it's way more money for, for the software, and it's, it's crazy. Um, that's not really the case anymore because you can emulate the hardware on something like a small little MacBook Air that I have here. I'm not saying I'm doing it, but you can. And then you can actually somehow get the ZOS images and boot it up <laughs> in your MacBook Air and then start figuring things out like, why is it telling me that my user ID is, is no good? Uh, no, <laughs> after maybe. But it runs, I mean, it, it just runs on normal, normal software. Uh, the creator, actually the maintainer of the code, I should say, is Tron Guy. Everybody knows who Tron Guy is? Yeah, some people know who Tron Guy is? Two people know who Tron Guy is? That's great. Um, he's the guy who dressed as Tron. He's, anyways, he maintains the code for, for it, and it's constantly being updated. It's not a dead project. It's constantly being updated. In fact, they, they sued IBM in Europe because IBM said, well, our software comes with the hardware. You can't buy it separately, which sounds familiar. And... And so they said, well, that's antitrust. You can't do that because we have the software that you can run on any x86 platform. So we just, want to, we just want to sell our clients that platform and then get your software and run on top of that. So it does work. It works really well. And if, if anyone's interested in how to do it, come talk to me after the talk, and I'll show, I can give you resources and how to do it and whatnot. Also, everything should be up on my, my website and my blog. Um, any questions? 
Either or. No, I'm using a 3270 emulator. And sorry, sorry, the question was uh, when I'm connecting to the mainframe, what am I using? Am I using just straight up Telnet? Let's see if I have it here. I'm actually using this, this little guy here. It's, uh, I don't have, I'm not connected to anything right now, but it's for Mac. But there's also X3270, which is great. Um, it's open source, you can run it on Linux. It's fantastic. Other question? Yeah. A good point. He's saying that, uh, so, so you bring a really good point. Most of the mainframes, these guys have been around for a long time. Um, the average age is 55 for a mainframe developer, the mainframe system programmer is what they call administrators. That's the average age, 55. So they've been around, they were around before really TCP IP. They were around before Unix. They were around before a lot of these things existed. So they don't understand the security implications of some of the decisions they're making. For example, letting, he was saying that sometimes he finds finger available on mainframes. Um, I have also seen that. It's just, it, it's not because they just, they're just not trained in, in certain networking type attacks, and so they just don't know. Anyone else? I think, yeah. Because it, well, I, okay, I don't want to speak for your, your people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but generally they say, oh, it's legacy and we're not going to touch it. And that's wrong. I just showed you. It's, the OS came out. I mean, they release a new OS every two years. So, and there's, there's really no reason other than no one, they don't. There's a great commercial if you see on IBM, someone was telling me. Um, there's like these dudes in a conference room and they're all talking and they're like, like oh, we got to do security this, security that. They're Windows and Unix guys and oh, we got to do this and that. And this bearded guy with suspenders is walking down the hall. He's like, hey, how come he doesn't have to do any of this? He's like, I'm legacy. <laughs> So that's, that's pretty much where it is. And I think, anyone, any more questions? Anyone, yeah? Is the uh, IBM user and the DPX user user group? I believe so. Well, on, on the test systems it might be. I generally, I hope it's removed. Oh, sorry, he was asking if, BP, if the IBM user, that default user, is on, is in this bpx.superuser group. Yes. Um, so the question is, can you, what's the auditing like? Like how, how good is the auditing capabilities? The auditing capabilities are fantastic. You can track down everything within reason. You can see it happening in real time on the mainframe. And there's products out there that'll let it speak to a SIM. So you can actually have these things speak to a SIM in real time. And then it'll alert on the SIM or it'll alert on ZOS if, you're, if your operations folks are keeping an eye out for it. Am I done? I'll come talk to you guys afterwards. I think I'm out of time. Um, if anyone wants to come see me, come on down. I'll just hang out. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs> Sorry.